Okay. Okay. Good. Good evening, everybody, or or maybe good morning to you if you are not in Hong Kong. Uh, we are deeply honored today to have uh, Mr. David Shard of uh, Queen's Council with us here today to speak to us on the topic of uh, determining the law of international arbitration agreements. New insights from the UK Supreme Court. Now, uh, David is admitted to the bars of England and Wales, uh, Loughton Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and the Caribbean. Uh, he has extensive experience as leading counsel in dealing with legal issues and disputes relating to commercial dispute resolution, construction, shipping, cross-border investment trade, pharmaceuticals, life science, sports, uh, litigation and arbitration. David is also an experienced international arbitrator and he's a panel arbitrator list in many well-known arbitration institutions. He has acted both as counsel and arbitrator in domestic and international arbitrations relating to construction and sports law. He's also active in the promotion of mediation, both as counsel and mediator. David has uh, over 20 years of experience at the bar, including the provision of strategic advice, as well as litigation, arbitration, and mediation. He has appeared before all of the civil and appellate courts and tribunals in Northern Ireland. He's also similarly active before the civil courts of England and Wales and Ireland. Um, during the presentation, may I remind the participants to type their uh, questions in the chat box. Um, David will answer your questions after, afterwards in the uh, question and answer session. Now, um, please join us in welcoming David. Um, David, the floor is yours. <clears throat> um, thank you, uh, Simon, for that very kind introduction. Uh, and, and welcome everyone to um, uh, this talk today. Um, it's been a while because of COVID um, since I've been in, in Hong Kong and I know things are difficult there at the moment and I hope everyone uh, and your families are all well. Um, to put myself in the mood, um, I, I'm wearing one of my very nice Hong Kong uh, tailored suits today and um, I look forward to being in Hong Kong um, as soon as possible. Anyway, today I want to talk about uh, the determination of the law of international arbitration agreements. And I'm going to do that with the benefit of two recent UK Supreme Court decisions. So the plan is to, uh, first of all, consider the notion of the governing law of an arbitration agreement, um, carefully noting that arbitration agreements are, are often inserted at the end of a contract, uh, but that they do form their own um, uh, contractual obligations in terms of an arbitration. Number two, to consider the facts, legal principles and an application of the judgment in Inca, uh, 2020 UK Supreme Court case. Uh, thirdly, to consider the facts, legal principles and application of the judgment in Kababji, uh, which is a very recent um, decision of just last year of the UK Supreme Court. To look at the takeaway points, um, what do these cases tell us about the development of the law? And then perhaps most importantly for Hong Kong practitioners, what are the implications of these decisions in terms of Hong Kong jurisprudence? And um, I will tentatively, um, given the audience, look at that uh, at the end, and perhaps we can deal with that in some questions and answers. So the key question for consideration uh, as part of the discussion uh, and the talk today is, where a contract specifies its governing law, but is silent as to the governing law of the arbitration agreement, the question arises as to which law governs the arbitration agreement, the governing law of the contract or the seat or the law of the seat. And as we will see, uh, and as we go through this talk, uh, there are different approaches taken in different jurisdictions. And uh, that can be very important if one is advising a client or if one is considering and trying to either enforce or annul um, an arbitration award in another jurisdiction. So the first case um, we want to look at is the case of Enca uh, and a 2020 case. And um, what, I've, what I've done here is I put up the actual uh, terms of the arbitration agreement, I've set them out there. And you can have a look at those uh, just as I read in some of the background to the Inca case. 
um, because the facts obviously are, are important, but they are quite detailed and it's easier just to read out uh, some of the facts to you. So in 2016, uh, a Russian power plant was severely damaged by fire. The appellant, Chub Russia, had insured the owner of the power plant, the owner, against such damage. The owner had entered into a contract with another company, uh, the head contractor, in relation to construction work to be carried out at the plant. In turn, the head contractor engaged the respondent, and that's Enka, a Turkish engineering company, as a subcontractor for the construction project. The contract um, made between the head contractor and Enka included an agreement that disputes would be determined through arbitration proceedings in London. In 2014, uh, the head contractor had transferred its rights and obligations under the contract to the owner. After the fire in 2016, Chubb Russia paid uh, an insurance claim by the owner and by doing so assumed any rights of the owner to claim compensation from third parties, including Enka, for damage caused uh, by the fire. So that's the background. Uh, relatively complex in terms of the position of the parties. But if you look at the, um, the agreement, the terms of the, um, of the arbitration agreement, you'll see that it's not very clear. And, and, and this might be surprising given um, the extent of the um, contractual obligations between the parties and the, the detail and complexity of the scenario. But if you look at those, we see that um, whilst there's talk about um, referral to arbitration, so there's clearly an arbitration um, clause <clears throat> and indeed we know that it's to be conducted in English language and conducted in London. Um, there's no reference at all to the actual uh, law of the arbitration agreement. The question is how do the, uh, the English courts deal with that? So the position um, was that uh, the UK Supreme Court held that the parties had not chosen um, either <clears throat> expressly or impliedly a choice of law governing the main contract. And you can see that it would have been much easier if the parties had done that. Um, and the, the court concluded that the reason they hadn't was because there was probably no agreement as to the choice of the governing law. The law governing the arbitration agreement was therefore to be construed by reference to the place in which had the closest and real connection, most real connection under English common law rules. And the UK Supreme Court concluded that the law of the arbitration agreement was English law. Now, <clears throat> um, in determining whether a contract said to be governed by a foreign system of law is valid, the court um, applies what is known as the putative applicable law test. And, and this is the law that would apply and would govern the contract if it was validly concluded. And it requires a backwards theoretical analysis. And um, the common law rules apply. And um, the starting point is to look at, um, look at the contract and see whether it's governed by, firstly, um, a law expressly or impliedly chosen by the parties, or in the absence of such choice, the law with which it, most closely, it is most closely connected. So that's the, the standard common law test. Oops, excuse me. Now, the, um, the Supreme Court, which differed from the approach of the Court of Appeal, but came to the same conclusion, that English law applied, clarified the position at paragraph 34 of the judgment, that the proper approach was to apply English law as the law of the forum, where the question is whether there has been a choice of the law applicable to an arbitration clause, the relevant English law rules are the common law rules which require the court to interpret the contract as a whole, applying the ordinary English rules of contractual interpretation. The main contract law is different, has no part to play in the analysis. So you can see that um, the approach taken by the court is simply to look at the common law rules and apply them. And now we need to look at um, 
some concepts which are applicable to arbitration agreements uh, and, and contractual um, obligations generally. Now, the first one is the, um, the principle of deposage, which is um, imported from civil law. <clears throat> and um, on, under this principle, uh, different obligations under a contract may be governed by different laws. Uh, and that is accepted as a principle in English law, but it is not widely applied. And the English courts apply a very restrictive approach to this. In fact, we can go back to the 1950 case of Keller and Midland, Midland Bank, um, and, and, which is actually quoted in the, um, in the, uh, uh, the judgment of Enka at paragraph 39. And the reference is that the common law will not split a contract in this sense readily or without good reason. So you can see that the general approach taken by the English courts is to be restrictive in terms of the concept of deposage. However, um, the principle of or the doctrine of separability is somewhat different, and that requires um, an arbitration agreement to be treated as distinct from the main contract only for the purpose of determining its validity or enforceability. And you'd see this quite often in practice where um, for various reasons, uh, a contract comes to an end, perhaps by way of frustration. Um, but of course, that does not determine the uh, either validity or enforceability of an arbitration clause, which is dealt with separately. So um, the judgment of paragraph 62 uh, sets out the position uh, clearly with reference to two previous cases and, and says as follows. Descriptions of an arbitration clause as, for example, collateral to the main contract in which it is incorporated with reference to the Hannah Blumenthal case, 1983 reported, uh, per Lord Diplock, or a separate contract ancillary to the main contract, as was referenced to the Bremer Vulcan uh, Schiffbau case, uh, 1981 reported per Lord Scarman, need to be seen in their context as ways of expressing the doctrine that the discharge by frustration or for other reasons of the, the substantive obligations created by the contract will not discharge the party's agreement to arbitrate. So um, the, the English courts take a, a restricted approach to the concept of deputage, but they do accept the doctrine of, of separability in terms of an arbitration um, agreement. Now, excuse me. Um, it's rare that an express choice of law is identified in respect of an arbitration clause. And you'll, if you think to any of uh, your, your own experience of dealing with arbitration agreements. Uh, and ask yourself how many times um, do arbitration clauses actually specify the choice of law that is to be applied. But it's much more common um, for an express choice of law to be made in respect of the contract as a whole. And certainly that's my experience. And the difficulty in the Inca case was that there was no express choice made uh, for the contract as a whole. And you remember we looked at that Earlier in this talk, we, we put up the different um, terms of the arbitration agreement uh, and there's nothing in that. And then it also happens to be the case that there was no choice um, of law made for the contract as a whole. So that might be an uncommon situation, um, but it does happen. And when it happens, obviously it creates a difficulty. Um, now, where you have that situation, there is then a strong presumption that the parties will have impliedly chosen the law of the seat of the arbitration to govern the arbitration agreement. And that's referred to at paragraph 59 of the judgment. So in a situation where, um, where you're looking to try and identify the, the, the law with the closest connection um, to the dispute, um, a, a starting point where you don't have any guidance at all from the, uh, the actual contract or from the arbitration agreement is to look at the seat of the arbitration uh, and in fact, that, that approach seems to have much stronger um, validity in the civil law jurisdictions, and, and we'll, we'll touch on that later on, um, where they take that as the highest level of guidance in terms of the 
proper law for the arbitration agreement. Um, I touch upon the effect of the uh, Arbitration Act 1996 and, and the common law contract. Now, um, the court noted that the arbitration laws of several other jurisdictions, uh, notably Scotland and Sweden, uh, provided the choice of seat amounts to an implied choice of law. Uh, I, I took an opportunity to look at the Scottish legislation, and indeed there it is. Um, when you choose the seat, you also have a Scots law implied into um, the arbitration agreement, and that perhaps makes things easier. Uh, however, the English Arbitration um, Act 1996 does not contain any such provision, uh, and uh, Section 4.5 and its legislative history, which are discussed at paragraph 76 to 80 of the, of the judgment of Inca, uh, they provide specifically for a situation in which the arbitration agreement will be governed uh, by a foreign law, notwithstanding that English law governs the arbitration process. That's paragraph 73. And, and no inference, therefore, could be drawn by reference to the Arbitration Act that the parties impliedly choose English law to govern the arbitration agreement by choosing an English seat for the arbitration. I, I put that in um, because I note that the, uh, the Hong Kong Arbitration Ordinance does not contain any such provision uh, uh, similar to Scotland or Sweden uh, and is in many ways very similar to the, uh, the English Act, um, albeit there's the, the model law uh, um, implications. Uh, another one of the one of the uh, the uh, um, great things, if, that, if that's right, choice of words about the Enke decision is that it really has been the first time that um, the UK uh, uh, final court of uh, of uh, jurisdiction has looked in great detail at the whole concept of uh, arbitration agreements and. The, the lordships in making that decision, uh, making that judgment, they went into great detail to look at the underlying principles, and we've touched on some of those already. Um, but another one that they that they look at um, is the what is known as the validation principle, and you can read there uh, um, exactly what that means in in, um, in clear words. But what effectively it means is that the courts assume that when businessmen enter into an agreement they expect that agreement to be valid and, and enforceable uh, and rather than null and void. And there's therefore a very strong inference that the parties could not rationally have intended another law to govern the arbitration agreement if that would mean that the whole um, agreement would be void or of no legal effect under that law. So there is an assumption um, that when this principle is considered, um, the, the correct law should be enforceable. And the court at paragraph 109 endorsed the formulation of Lord Justice Murabek in the Sul America case. Um, and, and in fact, the Supreme Court followed the decision in that case quite closely in many ways that commercial parties are generally unlikely to have intended a choice of governing law for the contract to apply to an arbitration ar agreement if there is at least a serious risk that a choice of that law would significantly undermine that agreement. So, um, where does this all take us? Well, as the parties in, in, in Enca had not made any choice of the law govern, governing the arbitration agreement, either expressly or impliedly, the uh, Supreme Court applied the third limb of the common law rules, that is, the closest and most real connection test. Um, the court noted that this operates as a positive principle of law. The court cannot ascertain an intention, expressed or implied, of the parties as to the law which is to govern their agreement. And um, you can see that they have they've also quoted from Lord Diplock uh, in the Siege and N and the navigation case from 1971, and it becomes necessary for the court to proceed to the second stage of determining itself what is the proper law applicable. 
This is applied as a positive rule of English law. It's applied not because it is the choice of the parties themselves, but because they never intended to exercise their liberty to make a choice, or if they did, they failed to make their choice clear. So the starting point is to look for uh, an express or implied um, uh, law governing the arbitration agreement. If you don't have that, you've got to apply the closest and most real connection test. And, and as we, we talked about slightly earlier on, um, I think it's from paragraph 51 of the judgment, um, there's a strong presumption that the seat of the arbitration will be that closest and most real connection test. Although, of course, it's, it's only a presumption and there may be other circumstances unique to that particular case which suggest otherwise. Now, um, having waited for many years for the Supreme Court uh, and indeed the its predecessor of the House of Lords to finally come to uh, a detailed written judgment on this issue, in fact, we have been spoiled and had two judgments within two years um, on this particular issue. And the second case I want to deal with today is the Kebab G case. And um, in this case, the Supreme Court reached the same conclusion as an in Inca in the context of enforcement of an arbitration award. Although, as we'll see, <clears throat> it was a slightly different context because um, this was to do with enforcement. And um, in a decision that directly contradicted the findings of the Paris Court of Appeal, in parallel annulment proceedings, the UK Supreme Court found that the arbitration agreement was governed by English law, being the governing law of the contract, not French law, being the law of the seat, as found by the, the Paris Court of Appeal. And um, uh, it's quite interesting because in the actual arbitration itself, there were three arbitrators. There was um, an English common law lawyer, and there were two French civil law, law lawyers, uh, and the English uh, common law, the English lawyer found um, in the same way as the UK Supreme Court, and the French lawyers found in the same way as the Paris Court of Appeal. <clears throat> now, I'm, I'm told that there, there is a, an appeal to the Court of Cassation in France pending. I'm not sure if that's been heard yet. Um, <clears throat> um, I suspect that that will uphold the decision of the French Court. And it then creates an interesting situation where we have um, two jurisdictions coming to two different conclusions. Um, and, and obviously that's one of the principles of, of, of comedy of, of law that uh, one tries to avoid where different jurisdictions arrive at different um, outcomes uh, in, a, in a similar case. So the, the actual uh, factual background um, in relation to the Kabal G case then is as follows. So there was a franchise development agreement, an, an FDA between uh, Kebab G uh, and the uh, Al Hamizi company, um, which was a subsidiary of Kut Food Group, Kuwait, the KFG. A dispute relating to the FDA arose and Kebab G commenced arbitration proceedings against KFG. So they, they went straight against um, uh, the, the parent company, uh, and that's relevant. The FDA was expressly governed by English law and contained an arbitration agreement, which provided that the seat of the arbitration would be Paris and that the ICC rules would apply. It did not specify the governing law, but stated that, uh, and in quotations, the, the arbitrators shall also apply principles of law generally recognised in international transactions. And the parties agreed that this referred to the Unidua principles of international commercial contracts. FDA also included uh, a new oral modification clause, uh, and that's an interesting point, but, but not one I'm going to be touching on um, today. The arbitral tribunal found that French law was the governing law of the arbitration agreement, and that was based upon the, the, the French seat of the arbitration. And then <clears throat> applying the French law, KFG was held to be a party to the arbitration agreement. Um, that would not have been the case under English law, and that effectively forms the basis of the, uh, the later uh, appeals. Um, parallel proceedings were then brought by KFG um, in Paris to annul the award, and by Kebab G in England to enforce it. Um, so you have the unedifying situation of two parties in, in, in two neighbouring jurisdictions <clears throat> effectively pushing the opposite direction. 
So in the Kabam key judgment, the um, in a unanimous judgment, um, the UK Supreme Court found in favour of KFG and held that, firstly, English law governed the validity of the arbitration agreement, uh, not French law, and therefore they disagreed with the suggestion that uh, the French seat was the was the trump. Um, under English law, there was no real prospect that a court would find KFG had become a party to the arbitration agreement, and procedurally, the Court of Appeal was justified in giving summary judgment, refusing recognition and enforcement of the award. So you can see that the um, the issue of the correct law of the arbitration agreement was vital because in effect that determined whether uh, KFG were a party or not and therefore whether they could effectively avoid the arbitration award. <clears throat> Now, um, in its judgment, um, firstly, the uh, Supreme Court referred to its own um, summary in Inca with reference to Article 5.1a of the New York Convention, <clears throat> which established that the validity of an arbitration agreement is governed by A, the, the law chosen by the parties, and B, in the event that no choice has been made, the law of the country where the award is made. <clears throat> Uh, and in Kibauchi, <clears throat> the court confirmed that the principle in Inca that where an arbitration agreement does not specify the applicable governing law, a choice of governing law in the contract containing the arbitration agreement would generally be sufficient indication of the governing law. So we talked about earlier on how it was not that common, uh, perhaps to find that the arbitration agreement has its own <clears throat> specific uh, law allocated to it or choice of law allocated to it, but it's very, very common. In fact, it's unusual not to have um, uh, a choice of law allocated to um, the uh, the actual contract, and that you can therefore imply that where there is a choice of law clearly made in respect of the contract, that that will also apply to the arbitration agreement. And the difficulty that arose in, in Inca arose because there was no choice of law in, in respect of the um, contract, or even the contract. So the UK Supreme Court <clears throat> also held that the principle applied not only prior to the issuance of the award, but also at the enforcement stage. So that's an important determination um, because obviously um, one, of the, one of the key um, determinations that the court can make is to uh, effectively enforce an, an arbitration award. Uh, and the fact that we have INCA uh, and uh, Kibauchi at different ends of the spectrum in relation to the arbitration process, we'll put it that way, is relevant. Um, it's also important to note that the law governing uh, the FDA, which was English, was the applicable law of the arbitration agreement. So um, we've gone through uh, quickly, there are two cases, two important cases on determining the law of arbitration agreements. So what are the, as practitioners, um, what are the takeaway points? Um, well, firstly, um, of course, and, and I haven't put this, but of course, first one is that because English law is uh, an important uh, and, uh, and appears in a large number of, um, uh, of, of arbitration um, cases, uh, it's, it's important to understand what the principles of English law are. And then moving on to the points I set out um, within the take point, takeaway points section. Um, firstly, um, the English law approach to determining the law applicable to an arbitration agreement is now clear. And I, I would say it's, it's crystal clear. Um, it's first confirmed by Inca and now by Kababji, having been unresolved for many years. Um, there remains uncertainty at the international level. The Paris Court of Appeal considered the award in Kibabji and reached the opposite conclusion on which governing law applied to the party's arbitration agreement. And you can imagine the, the difficulty and confusion that will um, arise from that um, for legal practitioners who are uh, advising in, in this area um, because there could be two radical um, different views and two radical different outcomes. <clears throat> um, from neighbouring jurisdictions uh, and um, 
uh, it'd be interesting to see how that uh, develops. Thirdly, in order to achieve certainty, um, contracting parties should, should ensure that they identify the law specifically governing their arbitration agreement, whether or not that is the same law that governs the main contract. So, um, in effect, it's it's like giving one of those talks after, after you presented a case of negligence to um, uh, to legal practitioners, where you go back and say, uh, please be very careful whenever you are drafting uh, an arbitration agreement. Um, make sure that you identify which law is to apply, uh, and um, you know, perhaps the various um, the, the, the various bodies that um, assist um, in arbitration can, can push this message that it's vitally important that arbitration agreements cover this clearly. Um, fourthly, contracting parties should not assume that the law of the seat will govern the validity of the arbitration agreement, particularly as a matter of English law. And there does seem to be a big divide between the common law and civil law jurisdictions. And without touching upon um, the law of civil law jurisdictions, there does seem to be um, a very strong presumption that the law of the seat will apply in those civil law jurisdictions and great care should be taken um, uh, when advising a client if there is a civil law um, jurisdiction named um, or, or um, as the seat of the arbitration and it's not clear um, where or it's not clear what the choice of law is in relation to the arbitration agreement. Um, implications for Hong Kong. So um, given um, given that I'm, I'm speaking to a large number of, of Hong Kong practitioners, I say this <coughs> um, uh, very uh, timidly and um, I say this to to assist debate, uh, and I'm very, um, very care will be very careful here, uh, uh, um, given um, my relative lack of, of knowledge in this area compared to those who attend the talk. But um, my 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 re review of the Hong Kong case law uh, would suggest that the courts in Hong Kong may take a similar course to that of the UK Supreme Court. Um, in, in um, Klockner Pentaplast case, 2011 case, um, the court held that the starting point must be the terms of the particular clause on the contract in question. Uh, first, the contract between the parties, including the arbitration clause, must be examined to see if there is any agreement expressed or implied by the parties as to both the proper law of contract or the lex arbitrary. It is only if agreement cannot be found that the implication arises from the choice of seat that the law of that place will be the lex arbitrary. Now, taking into account A, the governing law, which was German law as agreed in the contract, and B, that the parties' agreement that the third arbitrator should be advanced um, admitted to practice to law in Germany, and C, the fact that the governing law and the arbitration clause were under the same heading, governing law and jurisdiction, in the contract, the High Court determined that the parties impliedly intended that the governing law of the arbitration should be the law of Germany, um, i.e. the governing law of the contract. So in, in some ways this case helps, in some ways it doesn't, um, because I think there's only one direction in which um, the determination could go because of the various facts uh, and the, um, the various contents of the arbitration agreement. But it does tend to suggest that a similar approach would be taken to look at what is contained within um, the agreement expressed or implied, uh, and then, um, if that can't be found, to look at the choice of seat. So a similar, uh, I think, approach, um, and it will be interesting to see whether or not uh, the appellate court in Hong Kong um, looks at this issue itself. Now, um, having said what I've said, I then refer to a standard text <coughs> um, in, in Hong Kong, the Conflict of Laws, um, by Johnson and Harris, uh, and it says, in terms of um, the contract, if the contract contains a governing law clause and identifies a place of arbitration, uh, then the Hong Kong court should conclude that the arbitration agreement is governed by the law of the place of the arbitration. Um, the authors opinion that the conclusions of the case law are wrong as they are based upon older English decisions handed down before the commencement of the Arbitration Act 1996. They do, however, agree 
that the, um, in the absence of an express or implied choice of governing law uh, under the contract, um, but the arbitration agreement expressly or impliedly identifies a place of arbitration, then a Hong Kong court should conclude that the arbitration agreement is governed by the law of the place of the arbitration in accordance with INCA. Um, so a little um, difference or distinction there, um, and I, I would suggest that on balance, um, it's likely that the Hong Kong courts would go down the same route um, as the UK Supreme Court has in terms of Inca and Kebabji. But uh, I will very much value um, any input from the audience on this. And in fact, it might be a matter for some discussion afterwards if anyone um, uh, is, is happy to get engaged with that. And I would very much appreciate uh, learning a little bit more about this area of legal practice in Hong Kong. So, um, questions, and let me just bring up the... Thank you, David. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for your very wonderful sharing and advice. And now I think we can move on to the uh, question and answer session. Uh, may I remind the participants that uh, you can type your questions in the chat box and David will answer your questions. Thank you. I see one question which is very easy to answer. And the first question is, will the slides be provided? And the answer is yes, I'd be very happy to do that. Um, uh, I, can, I can arrange that through, um, through the Institute and that will be provided to every one of them. Yes, we will we, 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 we work with David. And since we have the speaker's consent, we can either upload the PowerPoints uh, to our website for everybody's reference or we, or make, or we can send the web, uh, the slides to the individual participants. We will work, work out with the uh, speaker. And one, one thing I can, can say, I would, I would certainly value if, if anyone um, out there has um, any, any thoughts about the, how, the, how the, the law will be applied in Hong Kong, I'd be very interested in, in finding out about that. Um, and um, I'll, I'll invite anybody either now or, or afterwards to, to contact me to, um, to discuss that. Well, let's give some time, uh, give the audience some time to type in their questions. Uh, in the meantime, perhaps I, can I ask, ask you a question, David? Yes. I, I remember the time when I was a, a, a law student. The professor used to tell us that, oh, you, you don't, don't try to draft uh, your own arbitration agreement, or you should always try to draft the uh, arbitration clause that mirror the institution that the parties has chosen. Uh, to, to, to administer the disputes. So uh, the, the most common scenario is that if we say for example, perhaps if we choose CTEC or uh, HKIC, then we will copy their, their model clause. But you, you see that in their model clause, there, there won't be any express choice of law for the arbitration agreement. So, it, so the normal, normal circumstances is that we will only have uh, an applicable law governing the whole contract instead of two applicable law governing both the contract and the arbitration agreement. So if we face with this scenario, so, 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 so how are how, we how going to reconcile if the applicable law of the agreement itself is different from the seats of arbitration? Yeah, so I think the first thing is, it's a point I made um, on my way through the talk that uh, it, it's a learning exercise perhaps for the, uh, the arbitral institutions who provide model arbitration clauses um, for contracts. I mean, I think as you rightly say, Simon, uh, most lawyers, whenever they um, are preparing a contract and they want to have an appropriate arbitration clause, and will simply dig out uh, one that's been pre-prepared and, and um, cut and pasted into the agreement. And, and in many ways, that is a, an excellent thing to do because most of the institutions have prepared really good um, arbitration um, agreements. The difficulty is, I think, after this particular case, or these cases, um, and the difficulty that arises between, for example, uh, the English jurisdiction and the French jurisdiction, uh, it is important perhaps for institutions to look at their arbitration agreements again uh, and um, think about inserting um, an express choice of law into the arbitration agreement. Um, part of the, the contract 
and of course, the, the as the, the the discussion um we, we did in the, we talked about in the discussion, it's very often the case that the contract itself will have an express choice of law clause, and that will be allowed to permeate through to the arbitration agreement. But there will be a few um there will be a few contracts where there's no choice of law clause at all, such as the Inca case. Uh, and it's interesting that in that case, the the court found that this was because the parties couldn't agree a choice of law, but probably they could have agreed a choice of law for their arbitration agreement if they thought about it. Mm, interesting. Um, I do. I, do, I see a few, a few um, questions that come through. I'll read out. I'll read those out in turn. And um, the first one then is based on the, the Inca case. French law should be applied to the arbitration agreement in the Babaji case. The Supreme Court changed its mind. Um, yeah, so the, the French, um, the, the system, the, the civil law uh, system uh, is very based, based very heavily upon the seat of the arbitration. And I, I think without fear of being contradicted, I would say that in most civil law jurisdictions, if you're, if you're having your, um, your arbitration in that seat and there is not an express uh, a, a clear um, choice of law clause, you're going to end up with the law of the seat being applied. Um, so I think that's, uh, and I think if you look at the the, the history of the um, the Inca decision, um, we go back to the I think it was the Sulamari case in 2012. Um, the the Inca case lent very heavily on that, uh, and and that was probably um, that was a very well written decision of the Court of Appeal, which had reviewed many of the earlier cases and there was what I would describe as a, maybe a loss of direction between 2012 and the Inca decision where there was a variety of decisions which seemed to go one, one way or the other and made the law uncertain and I think that's why the Supreme Court chose that case to make a judgment on uh, and I hope that hope that answers the uh, the question I, I don't think they I don't think the, the Supreme Court changed its mind I think they they effectively went back to the um, Sul America decision, and um, they they simply reinforced that as the direction of travel of English law. Um, so the second question then um, is this: Civil law jurisdictions seem to have many conflicting judgments in relation to the arbitration agreements and laws, as opposed to common law, which is governed by precedents. Cassation courts and civil jurisdictions provide wide and conflicting decisions on the same principles. Kebab G seems to be um, the different backgrounds of the lawyers in the case. And I think that's right. Um, you have, I think you need to look no further than the actual arbitration panel, which was one English and two French lawyers. And it was a 2-1 um, uh, in, in favour of French law being the applicable law of the arbitration. And I think that's absolutely right. It, in co the common law was developed um, to ensure certainty. And, and that's the basis of the doctrine of precedent, whereas it's not uncommon in civil jurisdictions to have um, courts in different areas of, say, France arriving at different conclusions on the same case. Uh, and I think that's just a, uh, a picture or a snapshot of the differences between the two legal systems. Um, the third question then, um, is a paragraph 29 of the uh, judgment in Kebabji. Uh, UKSC said, the principles for determining the law governing an arbitration agreement in Inca are the common law principles in conflict of laws. And there are different rules for common law and section 103 2B of Arbitration Act 1996. But at paragraph 36, uh, UKSC said the claimant accepted that Inca applies um, to 103 2B are there different rules for determining the law governing an arbitration agreement under conflict of law principles and the Arbitration Act? Um, yes, I think what, you, what we're getting at here is that the um, the, the Arbitration Act, uh, I, I think, is arbitration is specifically excluded from the non-common law determination of jurisdiction. For example, um, the, the Rome 1 um, uh, regulation under European Union law uh, the, the arbitration is actually excluded under the uh, under the regulation, so I think that's the reason for the difference between 
uh, what's set out in paragraph 29 and paragraph 36 of the judgment. Um, and I have one more question here. Uh, where the uh, central model law is stated as the governing law of the arbitration, but where the substantive law of the contract is stated as a jurisdiction which has adopted the model law 100% um, under its own arbitration law, act law uh, which law applies? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I'm thinking about that one. Um, I think I think it would be the um, the arbitration, the, the domestic arbitration law. I think would apply because, in effect, um, where a, a jurisdiction adopts the model law as its own arbitration law, um, obviously it has to be the, the domestic law, which is enforceable in the courts, and therefore that's the one that applies. And to give an example of that. Um, the uh, the Arbitration Act 2010 in Ireland is a model um, is model law which is then uh, obviously um, legislated for uh, in in the um, in, in the Irish Parliament and and my own experience dealing with that uh, it is that legislation which applies. I hope that answers the question because I know it's always difficult whenever you're put on the spot and you want to say something. Which you hope is accurate, uh, but you're not entirely sure whether it covers the uh, the question that's been answered properly. Is there any more question? Well, someone's going to have to chain there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, can I say thank you to everyone as well? And if anyone wants to en enlighten me further as to what they think the um, the position would be in Hong Kong, I I'd be very happy to uh, to have any correspondence on that. Um, I'd be very happy to do that. Actually, under the, the principle of separability, I used to think that the main contract and the arbitration clause are, uh, are separate, so, the, so that the, the law governing the main contract actually has very little bearing on the arbitration agreement. But it seems that the, the Supreme Court takes the view that the, the, the doctrine only applies uh, to the determination of the validity of the agreement instead of the choice of, of the law. Yeah, yeah. It's just validity and, and enforceability, the two things really that um, are relevant to that. Hmm. Okay, I did not see any more question. Is there any more question from the audience? If there's no more question, I think that concludes today's seminar. David, do you, do you have any any more comments you want to share? If not, I think um, I would just like to thank everyone for attending, and I would like to say that it's been a pleasure to to speak to you all. And um, I say I look forward to doing it in person and, and at some time in the future. And uh, everyone, uh, stay well and safe. That's a comment from uh, Mr. Clark. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Yes, I agree. It's really a very wonderful sharing and advice. Um, so, um, and I think that concludes today's uh, webinar. And thank you everybody for participating in uh, this seminar. And um, thank you, David. And I think that's all for now. So, um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Thanks. You can leave the chat room. Yeah.